Dr. Leanne Davey is Vice President of Team Solutions with Knightsbridge and an expert in group dynamics. She was also a speaker at a recent Strategic Capability Network event in Toronto. Leanne sat down with Canadian HR reporter DV to tell us how to recognize when a team is toxic. Why did you choose the word toxic to describe teams that aren't functioning well together? It's funny, the word dysfunctional teams has been the one that uh, is, is most common in the, in the field. And you know, the teams that I had been on, I, I tell the story of, of a team where the leader of the team phoned me and, and he was telling me about uh, the, the product that I had given them some information on. And it's a, a program we call team inoculation and we kind of lovingly refer to it as the flu shot for teams. And he phoned me and said, I got all the information about the flu shot. Do you have a rabies shot? And uh, I didn't know whether to laugh <laughs> or, uh, or groan. And, but, but really that conversation helped me realize that dysfunctional just doesn't really describe what it is, that um, some teams truly are toxic. And the other thing I really liked about the word is that we could all relate to the fact that not always are, are things toxic to the point where we keel over. Um, sometimes it's that toxins start to build in our body, start to slow us down or, or make us you know, mildly unhealthy, but, but over time really uh, you know, shorten our productivity or our lifespan. And that's what's happening on many teams. So, so the word gave me the flexibility to talk about teams that are truly toxic, but also about teams where you know, you know, some of those toxins may be undetected and things you need to actually get, uh, get a handle on and deal with before you become unhealthy. What are some of the less obvious ways that teams become toxic? There are a couple that I see all the time. So uh, one is a team that most people think is actually a great team. I call them the bobblehead team for the fact that when you look in, everybody's heads tend to be nodding up and down. And so, so a lot of people will actually describe that as a great team because it feels good, uh, it, it's easy, everybody gets along. The reason why that's starting to be a toxin that you have to worry about is that there's very little diversity of thought on a bobblehead team. And that uh, everyone thinking, there, there's a great quote from the psychologist Gordon Allport who says, when everyone thinks alike, no one thinks very much. And it really describes for me this bobblehead team where uh, there's going to be less and less and less innovation because you know everybody's thinking exactly the same way. There's going to be uh, very little risk mitigation because what happens when somebody gives an answer or a potential solution, it's like the, the family feud. As soon as somebody says it, everyone's good answer, good answer. And, and you know that's not actually going to have you say actually you know maybe we need to think about a different option. So so the bobblehead is one. There's another that's really common uh, that I call the spectator team, which is really just a collection of individual meetings with the boss. And the reason that spectator teams are a risk is that uh, there's no whole greater than the sum of the parts. There's no bringing together of unique perspectives. So over time, the the, the spectator team meetings tend to take longer and longer and longer because people are reporting out and sharing all sorts of information, but there's very little actual co-creation or collaboration happening and therefore very little benefit of having the team at all. You said that bleeding back syndrome or backstabbing is one of the most common problems with teams in Canada. So what does that mean for productivity and for the economy? Yeah, so, so the passive aggressive behavior that's the hallmark of a bleeding back team is a fundamental problem in the boardrooms of Canada. Um, what happens is that uh, it really slows us down. It means we tend to avoid the really uncomfortable decisions that we need to make. So what I see is, is important strategic moves in the business being delayed by months. And I can even tell you horror stories where they've been delayed by years. So, you know, in the meantime, the, the wily competitors that are smaller and more agile are coming up, um, while our, you know, our executive teams in big organizations and, and the teams throughout our organizations um, are, are fighting in the back alleys, they're, um, they're undermining decisions, they're, they're nodding and saying that they're going along, but they're failing to implement. So it means that it slows us down 
we, we don't take the bold or risky moves because, you know, if we say something that's controversial, we risk, you know, somebody gossiping about us or trying to reopen the decision. And so, you know, either we're not making decisions at all or we're making decisions and nobody's executing them because they haven't actually raised their concerns in the room. So it just means that our economy ends up sluggish. Um, we don't make decisions quickly enough. And, and I think we're seeing the effects of that on the global stage.